All right, welcome back to Dinosaurs. So we're going to keep rolling through module one. Again, some of these foundational concepts. Uh, a lot of it hasn't been directly about dinosaurs, so kind of weird for a dinosaurs class. But we're going to talk about dinosaurs later, I promise. We have already mentioned them and showed some really good examples. But these are things that we need to understand before we can have educated discussions about dinosaur evolution. We need to know about evolution in general. So we talked about taxonomy last time. We're going to talk about microevolution today, macroevolution on Wednesday, and we'll talk about the distinction a little bit later. Uh, and then we're going to talk about phylogeny and cladistics and really just be able to understand how to read all these different evolutionary diagrams that we'll be seeing later on in the course. So we're just trying to build a basic foundational skill set before we move into some of the more advanced stuff with dinosaurs themselves. So hopefully you're sticking with me. Uh, before we do that, some announcements. So if you have any questions, post up in the discussion board. Okay, so let's review taxonomy. So which is the only uh, taxonomic category that's actually real? So taxonomy is trying to put all these animals, all these organisms in the world into these buckets or these bins. Which of these is the only one that's actually truly real? So take a second look at, remember, uh, King Philip came over for good spaghetti, getting more and more specific as you go down, all the way down to the species, which is only one. And the only real one is the species. So uh, all these different filters here, animals is something that we've made up as humans to jump all the animals together. Chordates, things with backbone, mammals, carnivora, ursidae. These are categories that we created that are useful for lumping organisms together so that we can talk about them and communicate clearly with each other. And as soon as you say the word mammal, a couple different characteristics come to mind. So warm-blooded, fur-bearing, uh, live birth, mammary glands. Those, those things are all the baggage that comes with being a quote-unquote mammal. Uh, and then if you go all the way down to species, that's the interbreeding individuals of a species. And so that's the only thing that's quote-unquote real. Uh, the next thing, so a review of taxonomy. So these examples of saber teeth are an illustration of, so this is Smilodon, it's a mammal. This is Thylacosmilus, named kind of after Smilodon because of their similarities. And you can see a lot of similarities there. That's a marsupial, so a different kind of animal. And uh, Gorynychnus is a therapsid, a very ancient saber-toothed animal, perhaps the first occurrence of saber-toothedness. Uh, you can see that they superficially resemble each other, but you can see that they're different types of animals in case, in some cases, lived at very different times. So what does that mean? That means that they are, and this might be a little bit confusing because there's actually two answers here. Uh, they are analogous, which means that superficially they're similar, uh, but not because they share an evolutionary relationship. These things are very distantly related. They've converged on the saber tooth form because saber toothedness is an effective hunting strategy. So it's evolved different times independently in the fossil records. Smilodon and Thylacosmilus are very distantly related to each other. The only commonality they have is their saber teeth. Uh, okay, so make sure that you understand the difference between analogous and homologous and convergent versus convergent coming together on a form and divergent diverging evolution. Okay, so let's talk about evolution or particularly for today, microevolution, which is generally the level that we understand evolution at. So let's talk about that at first. And at the end of the lecture, I'll distinguish between microevolution and macroevolution. So we can't talk about evolution without talking about Darwin, but Darwin wasn't the first one to come up with this concept. Uh, so early on, there was this idea of kind of this hierarchy of life where we had kind of like uh, plants and then animals and then people and then the angels and then the gods or God in this case. Uh, there was this idea that there was like a hierarchy, a level, a changing. Uh, and then Lamarckian evolution, sometimes Lamarck gets blamed a little bit for this where like organisms change over time because they're consciously trying to. So like uh, giraffes with their 
very long necks evolved because over time giraffes were reaching and reaching and trying and trying. Uh, and over time, their necks actually stretched so that the changes in morphology, the changes in shapes that we see are changes in like the desires of the animal and they're, they're consciously making an effort to evolve towards that more perfect form. And what we see is that's not true, which we'll talk about later in the lecture, but uh, this is Darwin's original origin of species in 1859. You can find it pretty much anywhere now. Uh, he knew at the time that this was going to be a controversial work. So this was kind of generally the thinking of the day. The church dogma was really strongly ingrained. Uh, the idea that the creator wouldn't make all animals perfect right from the beginning and that organisms would change and evolve through time and especially that they would go extinct and disappear that was kind of blasphemous and heretical. And so he knew that that was gonna be problematic and he was going to publish after his death, but there was another researcher that was sort of working on this. And so he had to publish before he was scooped. Uh, he, somebody else was gonna publish on the topic before he got a chance to. So Darwin rushed to publish it ahead of time. So how did he get to these revolutionary ideas? So uh, he set sail on the HMS Beagle and this was in the 1830s. So, you know, quite a while before he actually published on it. Again, he kind of sat on it for a while and was like, do I really want to publish this? Uh, again, it was heavily influenced by the works of Lyell. So Lyell's Principles of Geology, we talked about this during the uh, geologic time lecture, this idea that the earth is very old and that processes that happened today happened in the past very similarly. The present is the key to the past, uniformitarianism, things work uniformly today, work the same way uniformly in the past. Uh, the idea of the space of having an old earth uh, made possible Darwin's concepts of large changes in evolutionary record through very small changes that build up over time. Uh, it's not possible to, for evolution to work in the Darwinian sense if you don't have a lot of time, it takes generations upon generations upon generations for these little changes to build up, these microevolution changes to accumulate over time. Uh, so one of the big inspirations that Darwin saw that really started pointing him towards these concepts is that, you know, if you, if you look at the birds of the Galapagos Islands, which he did in great detail, like, okay, well, there's a lot of different finches and all these finches sort of generally look mostly the same. But in detail, there are these subtle little differences. So he kind of started grouping them into like taxonomic groups and he broke it into broad, like the tree dwellers and the ground dwellers. And he started noticing that their beaks were very different shapes and that each individual finch species was very specialized to their own niche, their own role in the environment. Uh, so for example, the large ground finches had these very large robust beaks because they were cracking open very hard seeds on the ground, whereas some of the tree dwellers had maybe a little bit more pointy beaks. Some of them were for nipping out little delicate seeds out of like seed pods, and some of them were for insects. So this was a, a insect eater here. Their beak was designed for picking off insects. So uh, no beak was any better than another. That's a thing to keep in mind with evolution is that uh, natural selection, which we'll talk about in a second, favors the best beak for the role. So the large ground finch with its crushing beak is no better of a finch than the little insectivorous finch. They just live different lifestyles. He, this finch is perfectly suited to its lifestyle. This finch is perfectly suited to its lifestyle. They've devolved, uh, evolved different strategies for living within their environment. There's no better solution. They, they are both perfectly viable and work. Uh, so one thing that often gets sort of mixed up with evolution is this concept of survival of the fittest. So this idea that nature is red in tooth and claw, 
and nature is very like ruthless and the weak will be sorted out and filtered out and destroyed by the strong. And that's sort of a very big oversimplification. So the concept of natural selection is that nature selects winners and selects losers. Those that are fittest survive and those that are not don't. But this word fit is sort of problematic because it implies like when we think of fitness, we think of, you know, this, we think of big, strong, fast, like the big strong organisms are going to succeed and the little weaklings will be pushed aside. And what we actually see in the fossil record is like, for example, after the, uh, the Chicxulub impact, Triceratops and all the other non-avian dinosaurs, the non-bird dinosaurs went extinct and these little Morganucodon little mammals inherited the earth and Cenozoic became the age of mammals. Uh, I don't think anyone would look at this and say that Triceratops was not fit. Triceratops were these massive horned armored critters. They're very fit. They're very large. They're very strong, uh, very capable, and they have filled their niche quite well. Their problem was that their niche disappeared when the asteroid completely upheaval of the entire world. And now in this kind of post-impact hellscape, critters that could dig underground and forage for relatively small food that was left over, uh, they were now fit for this environment. They're not bigger, they're not stronger, they're not faster, they're just more able to succeed and survive in that environment. So keep that in mind, survival of the fittest does not mean the survival of the biggest, strongest, fastest. It means the ones that are best able to fit the niche, their role. So that's a very, that's something that a lot of people get wrong. Uh, so another person that was working uh, right around the time of Darwin, and Darwin actually didn't even know that he was working on it until later, uh, was a monk named uh, Gregor Mendel. He was working on hybridizing pea plants together. So he was taking pea plants and sort of breeding them together to try to make these pea hybrids. Uh, his work went mostly unrecognized until after he died. Uh, that's so unfortunately going to be sort of a common theme uh, in the course. Uh, but it, he, he was really the one that sort of built the foundation for genetics kind of as we know it. Uh, and so uh, it's, it kind of fills in a gap that Darwin had. Darwin had this idea that organisms change over time certain ones are more favorable than others for moving forward, but how that changed the next generation uh, wasn't really known. So only when we discovered these genes that organisms actually pass on genetic material to the next generation, this was the mechanism of inheritance, the way that organisms, the fit organisms, the ones that were best adapted to the environment that were more likely to survive and reproduce, Genes are the way that they pass that information, that, that adaptability to the next generation. Uh, and so there's this concept in Mendelian genetics or just genetics of a dominant trait and a recessive trait. So like for example, tall, the gene for tall pea plants is dominant, round peas, yellow peas, uh, green coat, pod shape, a big inflated pod, uh, pod color green and flower position, whether it be axial or, or terminal uh, on the plant. Uh, these are the dominant traits and these are the recessive traits. And if you think all the way back to high school biology, uh, you probably remember doing these punit squares. So remember for every organism, there's a male gamete and a female gamete and they combine. In the case of plants, it's uh, spores and eggs. In the case of humans, it's eggs and sperm, sperm and eggs, I should say. Um, so in this case, this is one parent here, and they have a gene capital B for dominant, lowercase b for recessive. The female has, again, uppercase b for dominant, lowercase b for recessive. When they combine, you get one gene from each parent. And so in this case of the combination, and again, which combination you get is pretty random. They split 
uh, the, and so here you get BB, capital B, capital B, two dominants. Here you get capital B, lowercase b, a dominant and the recessive. Uh, here B and B, uppercase B, lowercase b, BB, two lowercase b's. Uh, the two uppercase b's and two lowercase b's are homozygous. Homo means same. So they have the same gene. These are two dominant genes. These are two recessive genes. And then heterozygous means they're different. So heterosexual, different sexes, hetero means different. There's a one recessive and one dominant. And as you recall from high school biology, if a, if a dominant is present, the expression is going to be dominant. So like, for example, if there is a dominant trait for round peas present, the peas are going to be round whether there's a wrinkled gene there or not. The wrinkled is recessive. It requires homozygous recessive, two recessives to make this. So the wrinkled peas would require the BB, okay? So hopefully you remember this from genetics. If you don't, uh, I'll post some videos to help you review. Uh, so here's a quick quiz. So uh, what color will the indicated pea pod be? So here's the parent here. It is heterozygous. It's two different genes, a dominant and a recessive. Dominant uppercase, recessive lowercase. Here's a homozygous, same, recessive, two lowercase letters. You kind of go down the square like this. Uh, here, you'll get a Y with a lowercase Y. Here, you'll get two lowercases. Here, you'll get an uppercase and a lowercase, a dominant and a recessive, heterozygous. And here you'll get two recessives, homozygous. So in this case, with the Y, the yellow being dominant, what are we going to get? In this case, uppercase Y, lowercase Y becomes a yellow pea pod. The dominant trait is expressed. Why, why homozygous two recessives, the recessive trait is expressed and we'll get a green pod. Hopefully that's nothing new for you. Um, so another advance later on is that these genes often mutate and these mutations can be passed down to the next generation. One thing to keep in mind is that mutations are random changes in genes. So something happens to the genetic material, a random change is made. There's an error in the genes. The vast majority of these mutations don't do anything. They're neutral. Nothing happens whatsoever. Some of them are harmful. And so these mutations that lead to harmful traits that would make the organism less fit, less likely to survive, less likely to reproduce, these are less likely to be passed on. Some very rare mutations, however, are beneficial and it makes the organism better suited for the environment. And these will be more likely to be preserved, more likely to be passed on. But to remember that the mutations themselves are random. Uh, it's just as likely to be no change as it is to be a positive change as it is to be a negative change. There's no like directionality to this. Organisms don't like try to mutate towards a better form. It just randomly happens with gene mutations in the background. The mutations are random and the physical expression of those mutations is random. The way that mutations can happen is an insertion and additional amino acid is kind of shoved in or deletion, an amino acid is gone, it's missing. Or a substitution, the right amino acid is substituted out with a different amino acid. And so these are how gene mutations happen. And again, they're random. Uh, the consequence of this is that genes are expressed in different ways. So a genetic expression, the range of a population's physical characteristics so hair color, eye color, uh, all kinds of different properties are controlled by the population's gene pool. So a genotype is an organism's genetic code. 
genotype genetic. So that's the actual allele combination. So like uppercase B, lowercase B, that's the genotype of the organism. Uh, the phenotype is the physical expression. So f -f pheno physical uh, expression of the genes. So like in this case, uppercase B, lowercase B, a heterozygous combination with a dominant trait, the dominant characteristic will be expressed and you'll get brown eyes or brown hair or something like that. That's the physical expression. So the genetic expression, the genotype versus the physical expression, the phenotype. So these are the genes. If you have genes that look like this, it codes for the phenotype that looks like this. So this is apparently the genetic combination for green eyes in this fly. And so the physical expression is green eyes. Uh, in some cases, it can be a little bit more complicated than that. So like, for example, uh, coat color in dogs is polygenic, which means more than one allele is involved. It's not as straightforward as the dominant recessive homozygous, heterozygous. Uh, there's combinations of a couple different alleles. Uh, and so what we see is kind of this wider range of coat colors. You can have black labs, you can have chocolate labs, you can have yellow labs, uh, and you kind of get this bigger spectrum here. These are the male gamete combinations here, the alleles of the male's genetic information. These are the alleles of the female's genetic information. And it results in all these different combos here. And they're sort of kind of mixed a little bit. And this is polygenic. So it's not always as, comp as simple as the Mendelian genetics. Uh, but just basically know that this exists. And that's how we get all these different doggos. Uh, so there's really two different types of genes. There are structural genes, which is the actual type and structure of the chromosomes. Uh, and then there's regulatory genes that determine uh, whether or not a structural gene is actually turned on or not. Uh, so for example, the structural gene is whether you're coded for um, a different, say, like hair color or something. And then the regulatory genes, whether that's turned on or not, whether it's physically expressed or not. Uh, one thing that's very interesting, though, is that um, we often, and it's sort of erroneous again to talk about this, like uh, primitive organisms versus more advanced organisms. Again, organisms are developed to be fitting to their environment. We shouldn't really think in terms of primitive and, and advanced. All organisms are perfectly suited to their environment that they're in, and they're as primitive or as advanced as they need to be to do their job. Uh, but we would kind of, as humans, obviously we have this bias that we are the pinnacle, uh, we are the greatest, and we are the most complex. We're the only ones that can pose these questions to ourselves and approach this from a systematic way. We must be the most complicated, and, and, and we're not. So one thing that's very interesting is that there's, very, there's no relationship whatsoever between like number of genes in million base pairs and complexity of the organism. So like a pine tree has orders of magnitude more genetic information than we do. Uh, this is a logarithmic scale here and it's in millions of base pairs. Humans are here, pine trees are here. Onions have more genetic information than we do. Newts have more genetic information than we do. So, one thing that we notice about that, though, is that a lot of genes, as far as we know, don't actually do anything. So a lot of our DNA, a lot of our genetic code, a lot of the human genome doesn't actually do anything, or at least we don't know what it does yet. So this is kind of a frontier in science is like we, we understand in some ways what a lot of these genes do we're getting to the point with CRISPR and things like that where we can start editing these things and sort of opening this Pandora's box of, pre of tweaking human properties, human genes. But we know that there's certain ones that we can fiddle with and we'll get certain results, but a lot of them just don't do anything or we're just not sure. And so it's kind of weird that we would carry all of this information that doesn't really do anything.
or that pine trees would carry all this information that doesn't really do anything. Why is their genome so complex? Why are they carrying all this extra information around that as far as we can tell, it does nothing. So this is a outstanding question uh, in genetics in, in working with these genes is what, what do these things do? Uh, a good example of this is, is humans versus chimpanzees. Uh, if we look at our human genome, which has been fully decoded, it's like a hundred volumes of like thousands of pages of A, G, C, D uh, genetic information. Uh, we are 98% genetically identical to chimpanzees. So all of the differences that you can think of between us and chimpanzees is controlled by just 2% of our genetic code. Again, most of that genetic code does, as far as we can tell, absolutely nothing. Only the 2% separates us from chimpanzees. And you can see a lot of superficial similarities between us and chimpanzees, again, because of our shared ancestry. Uh, another thing that's interesting is that like 30 to 70% of the mammalian genetic code is just ran is just repeats that again apparently do nothing a lot of our genetic material a lot of that massive tome of the human genome is just repetitive strings that as far as we know do nothing uh, there's some interesting ideas that it's actually been imprinted there by bacteria or by viruses or it's our way of combating those and it just sort of builds up over time uh, but again we we don't know uh, Richard Dawkins took it to the extreme of that life is a way of replicating of, for these genes and that the selfish gene is just trying to reproduce to the next generation more of these genes. So every time humans reproduce, uh, it also reproduces this 30 to 70% of just junk genes that do nothing. The genes are using us as vehicles to reproduce themselves. So that's uh, kind of a out there way of looking at it, but it's interesting nonetheless. Um, with that in mind, let's think about natural selection for a second. So I told you that these genetic mutations are random and most do nothing. Many are neutral, most are neutral. Some of them are detrimental and some are beneficial. The gene mutations themselves are random. And so one, again, a common misconception is that mutations are random and thus evolution is random. The reason that evolution is not random is that natural selection is very much not random. Gene mutations are random. The expression of those genes will be random. Natural selection acting upon those genes is not random. So in this case, natural selection uh, first of all, holy wow, talking birds, that's amazing. <laughs> uh, disregard that. Uh, we're just looking at the beetles. So this is the initial state of the beetle population. There's genetic mutation, genetic differences in the gene pool that leads some of the beetles to be brown and some of the beetles to be green. Is there anything particularly better or fitter about a brown beetle than a green beetle? Uh, not immediately obvious. Uh, who cares what color it is? It doesn't really make a big difference. Although in this case, there's another process acting in the environment whereby these birds really, really like the green beetles. They're going after the green beetles. They want them, they like them, and they're actively hunting the green beetles and not the brown beetles. And so now all of a sudden this mutation that was random now it's being acted upon by nature. It's being selected. Nature is picking winners and picking losers. Uh, in this case, nature is picking the brown beetles as the winner because the birds are selectively eating the green beetles. So when we move to the next generation, the green beetles are a lot more likely to be killed off before they can reproduce. And so the genes that they carry that make them green are less likely to be passed on the next generation. The brown beetles are less likely to be eaten. They're more likely to reproduce and they're more likely to get their genes into the next generation. And so over time, there's this genetic drift 
where the green genes are slowly filtered out. There's less and less of them over time. And there's more and more of the brown genes, not because there's a more frequent mutation towards the brown, <clears throat> but because that brown gene is more likely to be passed on to next generation. It, there's a filter going on here that's not random. The birds are filtering out the green beetles and the brown beetles are being the winners. After a while, this happens. And over time, the green beetles have been totally filtered out and brown beetles have flourished. And now brown beetles are the norm. Back here, green beetles were the norm. What's gonna happen though is that, well, now all of a sudden these birds that we're selecting for the green beetles, now there's no green beetles left. So they're gonna have to adapt. Uh, they might find a different food source or they might decide that brown beetles are delicious now and they might start filtering out the brown and the green might make a comeback. Uh, there's nothing inherently fitter about being a brown beetle, but nature is acting upon it in some way. There's also that famous example of the salt and pepper moths where they were whitish and they would blend in on the birch trees, but then England started going through the industrial revolution, smut and smoke would gather on the white birch trees. The white birch trees started becoming kind of darker gray birch trees. And so the moss that weren't white, that had a little bit more black on them, started to actually blend in better. And so again, this is an example of natural selection. There's nothing inherently better about being a white moth or a blacker moth, uh, but natural selection over time, camouflage being different, different genes will be favored over others. So the mutations that cause the color differences are random. Nature acting upon those color differences is not. That filter is very much not random. Uh, so here's some common misunderstandings of evolution. The first one is that we use the word theory in science a lot different than the layperson does. So like, this is a stupid comic here. Uh, you shot my dog. Uh, you can't prove that. It's only a theory. Uh, pretty dark. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, but again, like, it's only a theory or I have a theory. This is the way that people use the word theory in common conversation. In science, it means something different. Gravity is just a theory. Theory means that it's a hypothesis that's been kind of very long standing and it's held up to all the testing that we've had. This theory of evolution has been under testing since 1860. And some things have failed that test and we've revised and gotten closer to the truth. Remember that science is a process Science is not all of the known information that we have as humans. Science is the process whereby we filter the information that we have, we throw out stuff that we see as wrong, and we try to replace it with stuff that's better. Is it right? Probably not, but it's better. It's closer to the truth. This is the theory of evolution. Some of it is probably wrong in detail, but over time we've gotten closer and closer to the truth and it fits the data better and better. It fits the data the best that we have. That's a theory, a long-standing hypothesis that stood the test of time for, in this case, over a century. It's not just a theory. Uh, another thing is that evolution is slow and steady and incremental, and we'll talk about that a little bit more next time. But if evolution is slow and steady and incremental, why are there so many big jumps in the fossil record? Uh, we've already talked about how the fossil record is really more gap than record. Rock is missing. There are big pages of the book of life, the book of history that are just torn out because rocks are eroded away. All the fossils in those rocks are eroded away with it. All that stuff that we could have known about those organisms is missing because that rock record is gone. That fossil record is gone and it leaves behind these gaps where it looks like a big jump from something to another something. Uh, it may have been that it was a slow and steady gradual change and the record of that change is gone. But so that, that kind of leads to this idea of like missing links. So like we have this, uh, these data points here 
uh, maybe like a slow, steady progression from one organism to another. Uh, but there's these jumps in between. Look at all these gaps in between, these missing links. Well, if you find a missing link, so here's a data point, here's another data point. Let's say that this is like Australopithecus and this is like Homo erectus or something like that. Uh, we find a transitional ancestor that goes in between. Uh, we found a missing link. Uh, that didn't really help because now we have a missing link on both sides. We've actually doubled the gaps. So all we can do is just kind of fill in the fossil record as best we can. There's always going to be gaps. That's the nature of the fossil record. Missing links is not an indictment of the fossil record. It's an expectation. We know that the fossil record is imperfect. We know these gaps will exist. The more we fill these gaps, the more gaps we create. They're smaller gaps, but there are more of them. Uh, and then the last thing is kind of this idea of design and complexity. A snowman, especially one that can talk, <laughs> uh, is very complex. Uh, could it arrive from just chance from these snowflakes? Again, this is kind of misunderstanding the nature of evolution. This is kind of saying that, well, you know, gene mutations are random. How can random gene mutations combine to make something that looks complex and looks like it was designed for its purpose? Well, that goes back to the misunderstanding. Yes, the, the mutations are random. Natural selection is very much not random. A better example would be like, okay, snowflakes are falling from the sky. Every snowflake that happens to land in the spot that makes it look a little bit more like a snowman gets preserved. And every snowflake that doesn't would get wiped out. That would be the idea of a natural selection filter. The filter is on to preserve things that make a better snowman, a more fit snowman, and eliminate things that don't. And in that way, you could very easily make a snowman from random snowflakes because there's that filter of natural selection that is very much not random. In the example of the beetles, whether you're green or brown beetle was just a result of random genetic mutation at the beginning. But when the birds were filtering out the green beetles, that was natural selection and that's not random. And that's something that a lot of people don't understand. Uh, a very common example of this that's given is like the eye. So like the eye is irreducibly complex. Uh, if the eye was developed over stepwise increments, at some point it wasn't a fully functional working eye. What good is half of an eye? Well, uh, half of an eye is better than no eye. The first kind of eyes in organisms were like light sensitive spots. They weren't the fully functional eye with the lens and cornea and all that stuff. This really complex design or apparent design, I should say. It eventually it grew up over time with these small incremental changes. It wasn't a fully developed eye until it finally was, but every path along the way, every slightly better version was slightly better and slightly more fit, slightly more likely to see that predator coming slightly more likely to dodge that predator, slightly more likely to not get eaten by that predator and pass the genes on to the next generation. So these are some very common misunderstandings. And uh, if you have any questions, post up on the discussion board. Uh, another thing that sort of gets really caught up in evolution, and you can kind of see it a little bit even in this chart behind me, is that we often see evolution as sort of a linear a uh, goal-minded thing where there's like a directionality to it and there's a goal and that all of geologic history, all of evolutionary history was marching towards humans, the pinnacle of evolution that, that we see before ourselves now. Again, we're probably the first organisms that have the ability to ask these questions. That's pretty cool. We're pretty, we're certainly pretty advanced and pretty intelligent, but evolution didn't have like a directive to move towards us. Uh, in a lot of ways, we were the result of this natural selection over time. Why do we have big brains to be able to talk about these questions? Because the big brains were helpful in solving problems in our environment. Uh, we developed in an environment where solving problems mattered. 
bigger brains mattered, being able to talk with each other and communicate and coordinate and have culture and language that mattered, that made us fitter, more likely to survive. Uh, and so that's why there's this apparent directionality. But uh, if we look at this kind of iconic image, uh, sometimes also called the road to homo, homo sapiens, again, the first problem with this is that it looks like it's kind of linear and directional. Another problem is the baggage that comes with well, chimpanzees are back here and humans are here. And one con is like, if we evolve from chimpanzees, why are there still chimpanzees? Uh, we didn't evolve from chimpanzees. We evolved from a common ancestor with chimpanzees quite a while ago. That break was millions of years ago. Chimpanzees branched off one direction. We branched off another divergent evolution towards differing forms. Uh, so that's one complication. Another complication is that it like chimpanzees are lesser beings than us, and that's not true either. Chimpanzees are very well adapted to do the jobs of a chimpanzee in the environment of a chimpanzee. Chimpanzees are a lot better at being chimpanzees than humans are at being chimpanzees, just as we are much better at being humans than chimpanzees would be. So don't measure an organism by its ability to be human-like, measure an organism by its fit to its environment. Uh, and then the last reason why these are so problematic is, well, uh, they're very Eurocentric at best and, and downright racist at worst. Uh, as you can see, not only does the human become more human-like and more upright, uh, it also becomes more Caucasian, more blonde, lighter skin, less hair. And so this is a problematic representation that again, not only is the pinnacle of evolution human, uh, it's also male and it's also European. And so this is another problem with this diagram here. And, and this sort of thing propagates a lot of these myths and a lot of this stuff that gets all caught up in white supremacy and all these other problems that we have. So uh, something as simple as this iconic image uh, over the years develops this kind of baggage that goes along with it. So again, be conscious of this, be conscious of the biases inherited with this, uh, be conscious that this is dramatically oversimplified uh, and it can have a lot of negative connotations. Uh, so how do we know that evolution happens? What is the evidence that scientists use to support that this happens? A lot of the stuff that we've talked about seems a little bit unlikely. Like, again, like humans evolved from all these little incremental changes without any kind of guiding hand or direction, just through random mutations that were acted on by the environment in a non random way. That seems hard to believe. Uh, and it really is. It is sort of hard to believe. And there's this expression in science like, the burden of proof is on the person making the extraordinary claim. If we make an extraordinary claim that evolution exists, uh, we better back it up. So how do we back it up? Uh, the main evidence that we use are the existence of these homologous structures. Uh, we'll review again what homologous structures in just a second, but they are evidence that evolution happens. Uh, there is also vestigial structures. We'll see that in a little bit more in detail, but they're features that are no longer needed, but they're still there. Uh, and then occasionally we have these mutations that sort of show an earlier form. So let me just kind of walk through each of these individually. So uh, again, homologous structures, this shouldn't be news to you, but they're features with the same structure because we shared a common ancestor. Uh, in some cases, they have differing functions, but not always. So for example, the human hand, five digit human hand, five digit cat paw, five-digit whale flipper, five-digit bat wing. Why five digits? Five-digit ancestor all the way back at our last common ancestor. The homologous structures are evidence that we evolved from a five-fingered ancestor all together, the mammals, all based from a land-based five-digit ancestor before we split off in our divergent directions. Another example is the existence of vestigial structures, features that are no longer needed in the organism, but they're sort of they're still there as sort of a record of where we came from. Uh, 
Uh, the best example is probably the hind quote unquote legs that are present in cetaceans. Cetaceans, things like whales, dolphins, um, they have internally just kind of floating freely in their body, a uh, dramatically reduced pelvis and femur. Why is that there? They don't use the pelvis for anything. It's not used at all. It's just free floating around in the body. Why is it there? Because the ancestors to these now marine mammals was a land dwelling mammal that had four limbs. Over time, the limbs became more and more adapted to moving around in the aquatic environment. And once you were fully aquatic, the hind limbs were much more efficiently replaced by a tail to swim more efficiently. And you don't need the limbs anymore. It's just basically drag, it's baggage. And so over time, those hind limbs were reduced. The organisms that had further reduced hind limbs were at a little bit of an advantage. So over time, it was selected against that the limbs would get smaller and smaller. That was a fitter design. It fit the environment better. They were able to move around a little bit quicker, a little bit better, acquire a little bit more food, make themselves a little bit more likely to survive, and a little bit more likely to pass on their genes to the next generation. Generation after generation after generation, that little tiny advantage translates into evolutionary change. Those mutations that initially were random were acted on by very much not random natural selection. Uh, and the last piece of evidence is atavism. So atavisms are these very rare mutations. They don't occur very often. But when they do, they cause an ancestral trait to be expressed. So for example, humans do not generally have tails. However, our ancestors did. And somewhere in our genetic code still lurks that information about having a tail. And if there's a mutation in the structural genes uh, that kind of turn that on, you'll get a different trait. So every once in a while, humans are born with tails. Uh, usually they're kind of surgically removed and you live a normal life and nobody ever even knows. Um, but this is an actual human baby with a tail because our ancestors had tails. Uh, this is a horse that has toes. It has extra digits on its feet. Uh, again, thinking back to the last lecture, that example of the horse evolving from a five fingered ancestor gradually losing those and converging to the hoof. Uh, occasionally there's an atavism where they have those ancestral other digits. So these atavisms are evidence that this, this, these genetics is still present inside of us and sometimes it mistakenly gets turned on. Uh, and then the last piece of evidence is that we can directly observe it. So evolution within a species or what we call microevolution can be observed in the lab directly. We see it happening on human timescales. It can also be observed in nature. Uh, it's a lot more likely that we can see it in organisms that have really short generations. So bacteria reproduce very rapidly and that process of mutation and natural selection is sort of sped up on the generations. Unfortunately, we are witnessing this with the coronavirus. The coronavirus reproduces, it has short generations, we were starting to see these mutations, these new strains developing. Um, weeds do this too. And what we see is that weeds slowly are being, well, so like we start spraying insecticides, the weeds that are immune to those insecticides live. They pass on to the next weeds generation. The ones that don't live are weeded out. <laughs> uh, so over time, weeds start to develop a resistance because the ones that survive to reproduce are the ones that were immune to the, the herbicide. And so we have this now problem where we're now in an arms race with the weeds where they've become resistant to gliophosphate or Roundup as we call it. Uh, we're seeing the same kind of arms race with uh, bacteria where they're starting to become antibiotic resistant because if you have an infection make sure you take your entire antibiotic course because any bacteria that live are immune to those uh, antibiotics and they'll start reproducing and their offspring will be immune to those antibiotics. And the last thing is the distinction between microevolution 
and macroevolution, microevolution, what we talked about today, are small incremental changes within a species, how a species kind of changes over time, such as building antibiotic immunity. Macroevolution is actually splitting off into different species, where these small changes have resulted in changes that are so large that they're no longer able to successfully interbreed. There's a different species that's macroevolution. This is much harder to see on human timescales. There's very kind of few examples of well-documented macroevolution. Uh, are it, is it just the same process as microevolution, just scaled up? There's a lot of debate about that. And that's what we'll talk about next time. So that's all I have for today. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you're following along and goodbye.